name is Kristen Lukes, and I'm with the Department of Employment and Economic Development. And we um, administer several of the programs that are going to be discussed today. The Contamination Cleanup Investigation and Wrap Development Program, Contamination Cleanup Program, and we might even mention our Redevelopment Grant Program from time to time. Michael, you want to go next? Yeah, thanks, Kristen. Uh, Michael Torres with uh, Hinman County um, with the Environment and Energy uh, Department. And we administer the ERF or Environmental Response Fund and a couple other assessment funds. And I've got a, a background in consulting prior to working here. Happy to answer any questions. Martha? Hi, uh, good afternoon. My name is Martha Faust, and I'm a supervisor in the Brownfields Community Outreach and Engagement Unit at the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. And I'm here on behalf of some investigation and assessment funds that the agency has through the US EPA. Ella. Hello, um, I'm Ella Mitchell. I'm with Ramsey County Community and Economic Development, and I uh, administer the Environmental Response Fund and also work with our team on uh, our newer program, the Site Assessment Grants. So I'll be able to talk about both today. And I'll pass it back to Marcus. Hi, all. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, I am Marcus Martin. I work for the Metropolitan Council, and I will be talking about a program called the Tax Based Revitalization Account, or TBRA. All right. Well, if you're unfamiliar with brownfields or contaminated sites, you might be asking yourself, well, what is a brownfield? Why should I care about this? Brownfields are basically development sites where there's real or perceived contamination that adds extra costs and time to developing. So why would you choose those sites? What's the upside? Well, those sites are typically well positioned near existing infrastructure, transportation routes, and other opportunities. So how do we address these challenges of developing on a brownfield site? Well, first off, by offsetting the redevelopment costs. So we always say we're leveling the playing field for developing on these sites with extra challenges versus developing on a cornfield. So the public sector has grants and in some cases, low cost loans that can help make your development financially feasible. We have grant programs that cover all the state, there's a couple of statewide programs and then some that cover just different parts of the state. But together we can pay for common contamination problems that require soil cleanup, vapor, uh, soil vapor mitigation, and sometimes things like abatement in buildings. So some of our programs require a development team to work with a public applicant. Others of us or others of our program allow developers to apply directly to the program. So there are two main types of grants. There are grants for investigation and grants for cleanup. So today we're going to start with an overview of the investigation grants. For those of you that haven't heard of Brownfields, uh, finding out about contamination helps people know the potential risks to your health based on how the property was used before. What to do about those risks, depending on how you will use the property in the future, and estimate what it will cost to make the site safe for use again. So let's look at what kind of work is eligible to be paid for uh, with grants, Brownfield grants. So together we have seven different organizations that can pay for site investigation costs like environmental consulting fees, laboratory fee, drilling soil borings site assessments, cleanup plans, and voluntary MPCA brownfield program fees. So these, these costs are commonly summarized by the work required to complete the related environmental reports. Those are reports like a phase one environmental site assessment or a ESA, a phase two ESA, or a cleanup plan, what, what we call either response action plans, or you'll often hear the term RAP. We'll just call it a RAP. Uh, and for some of the programs, we can also pay for hazardous building material, asbestos or lead based paint assessment and abatement plans. So those are similar, but not exactly the same. Let's start looking at a summary of 
just the eligibility and the timing for each program individually. We'll start with DEED, and then we'll talk uh, afterwards about more of the competitive priorities for each organization a bit later today in our, our presentation. All right, well, just quickly, DEED offers um, about $250,000 each spring and fall for environmental investigations. We actually have about 500,000 available per year. We can split that in half as we often do, um, but it doesn't have to be exactly 250 each time. You must be a city, a county, or a local development authority to apply. I would say most applications come from cities. We offer up to $50,000 per site, um, but there's also an additional 25% match. So um, you may not need that much in grants. So I'm gonna turn it over to Martha so she can summarize another statewide source for investigation. And we'll talk more about DEED's funding priorities later in the presentation, but know we're looking primarily for sites that eventually will end up having jobs or added taxes to the community. Thanks, Kristen. Yes, the MPCA also offers found funding for brownfield investigations. Our funding comes from the US Environmental Protection Agency and all required work is done by MPCA contractors free of charge to the grant recipients. So for our program, applicants can be local governments, community-based organizations, tribal entities, or emerging developers that have completed five or fewer projects. And the grants pay for the same type of work that was described earlier, such as phase one or phase two environmental site assessments, as well as sampling and analysis plans and preparing a cleanup or response action plan. They can also be used for hazardous building material surveys. And unlike other investigation grants that you will hear about today, community engagement and reuse planning. The grants cannot be used for abatement of radon or mold or any cleanup actions. So applicants can request funds for any sites in Minnesota with known or suspected contamination, except not Superfund sites, closed landfills, or for renovations or expansions of single family homes. And finally, our priority is sites that will provide community benefits in locations with potential environmental justice concerns and or sites in small communities in greater Minnesota. The Metropolitan Council is trying something new with its environmental investigation program this year. We are uh, trying scattered site investigations. So applicants, and those are cities, counties, local EDAs, can ask for up to 250,000, but you can only spend up to 50,000 per site. You have to identify at least one redevelopment site to be investigated, and then you can identify the future sites for investigation anytime during that three-year grant term, if, if you are awarded a grant. Uh, but you do have to identify the site before you do the work, and there are no grant extensions. So we're trying something different with investigations this year. Let's uh, hear about investigation grants through uh, Hennepin County. Thanks, Marcus. Our investigation grant options with Hennepin County, we, um, our brownfield investigation funding is also offered using county funding distributed by Minnesota Brownfields or uh, nonprofit developers or sites that will be developed into you know, affordable housing in, in Hennepin or, or Ramsey counties. Um, you can apply for investigation on a site. Nonprofit developers or cities sign a contract with Minnesota Brownfields. Minnesota Brownfields assigns a pre-qualified contractor to do the work. So you get the reports and Minnesota Brownfields pays the bills, uh, which sounds pretty easy, except there's a, a couple of exclusions. Uh, the grants can't be used for asbestos and lead-based paint abatement or mold remediation. For a uh, site in Hennepin County, for example, the applicant must be a registered nonprofit, a community group, or government entity. 
you need to either own the site or have a purchase agreement in place before applying for the grant. And the award limit per project is approximately 15,000, but we prefer 12,000 within uh, within 12 months. If your project isn't in Minneapolis, you will need a resolution of support for your application from the from that city council. Uh, Minneapolis has this in place. So next, we'll hear from Ella to tell us about funds that can be used in Ramsey County. Yes, so in uh, Ramsey County, we have our site assessment grants, which are very similar to the Hennepin County grants, but obviously in the East Metro. Um, so we have uh, $125,000 per year to spend um, with a maximum of $25,000 per site. Funds are available on a rolling basis until they uh, run out. So, you know, we do encourage people to get applications in as soon as they can. And again, this is also administered through Minnesota Brownfields. To qualify, the site has to be in Ramsey County with the exception of the city of North St. Paul, because uh, this program is funded through our um, Housing and Redevelopment Authority levy, which uh, does not include North St. Paul. Again, similar to Hennepin County, uh, applicants can be nonprofits or government entities. Uh, the one difference is that uh, emerging developers are also eligible for this program. So uh, there's a definition of that on the site assessment grant website, but it essentially is newer developers who have done fewer than five housing um, or commercial projects in the past 10 years. While we pay for the same types of things that have been mentioned already, phase ones and phase twos, we also will pay for radon testing in some situations. If you will be asking for funding for radon testing, you must be either a nonprofit or a government entity, and your future development must include affordable housing. And as it says on here, we also uh, prioritize, among the other things we'll go into later in the presentation, environmental justice areas. So. Dakota County, uh, the CDA, uh, offers brownfield investigation funding among the eligible activities for their redevelopment incentive grant program, as more commonly known by the initials, the, the RIG. They uh, wanted us to know that uh, eligible applicants include cities in Dakota County and developers, but not townships. There is 100,000 that was made available uh, in the fiscal year starting in July 2023. And there's about 150,000 left in the rig. So some of the funding could go for non-investigation activities, uh, more project-related uh, activities. Uh, the maximum available per site for investigation, though, is 25,000. And up to two investigation grants will be awarded per applicant each fiscal year. So that's that uh, June to July time frame. Uh, you will need to submit a letter of support from the city signed by the mayor or the city administrator or the uh, city manager with your application. It's usually pretty quick, though. Uh, grant recommendations are usually made within 30 days or less after receiving a request. So those are a couple options that there are available for investigation grants. Let's just pause here for a moment and see if there are questions about what we've presented so far before we get into cleanup grants and those uh, funding priorities for uh, com competitive grants. All right, so as Marcus said, we've covered a lot of options for environmental investigation, um, some statewide, some um, more localized, and some with deadlines and some with rolling applications. So um, we're gonna now take a look at some options for cleanup. Together, collectively, we have sources that can pay for the costs of cleaning up soil contamination, managing soil vapors, sometimes pre-treating contaminated groundwater, and for some programs, asbestos or lead-based paint abatement in buildings before demolition or significant renovation. The grants are competitive, and we typically get one and a half to two times more or more um, the number of grants than we can fund. So we're typically oversubscribed. Our grant programs intentionally have many similarities. Uh, for example, we offer the funding at the same time of year. Uh, we consider many of the same factors when recommending projects to receive a grant. So if you need financial help to clean up a site, we encourage you to apply to more than one grant program if you qualify for 
more than one and stack that funding, stack those sources for those qualified projects. Each of the grant programs to varying degrees considers how contaminated a site is, the long term public benefits after the cleanup and construction are complete, things like job growth, revitalized tax base, adding affordable housing, or in some cases, new public facilities on former brownfields. We also consider the need for funding and whether all the partnerships and public processes needed are in place, kind of getting started on your project soon. So think of that as part of a readiness evaluation. So starting with DEED again, let's look at how each uh, program prioritizes these similar factors and some of the unique aspects to know when applying for a cleanup grant uh, in particular. Great. So there's multiple choices for contamination cleanup as we're learning. Um, as was just mentioned, we encourage you to apply to more than one grant or when possible. Although the grant programs may seem the same at first, each program is looking for certain things. So cleaning up contamination is a big part of deed scoring and priorities, but deed also scores applications based on economic benefits of the site's future development. So we look at things like jobs, taxes, um, those listed on the slide. If you're thinking about applying to DEED, think about how your project will support long-term job creation and retention and increases in the local property tax. Because we also have grant rounds every six months and want projects to begin cleanup you know, as soon as possible, as soon as the funding's available, readiness is a major factor in DEED's decision criteria. We also look at financial need, reducing blight, whether or not the app applicant is contributing to matching costs and other public benefits the project may offer. So for example, if you're thinking of applying for a deed grant, a market rate apartment or a commercial industrial project or a retail project may best meet the selection criteria. We'll look at some examples that demonstrate the criteria in more detail. So here's a couple of examples of projects funded by DEED and others as well, um, starting with the market at Malcolm Yards. So this project was an old machine shop in Minneapolis. The machine shop was vacant for some time when the building was partially burned down. Contaminants of concern included asbestos containing materials within roofing materials, in building debris, and in the shallow soils. Also, um, polyaromatic hydrocarbons or PAHs, um, various metals such as arsenic, lead, and mercury, and also PCBs were uh, located in fill soils at the site. In addition to that, since they had everything else, they also had petroleum impacts to the soil from an underground storage tank that was previously removed. The cleanup and construction experienced several delays. Um, but the project opened in 2021 and is now an innovative food hall called The Market at Malcolm Yards. There's nine unique food vendors um, from new and experienced chefs that'll change from time to time. Um, and you can kind of see that in the upper right photo. Um, that's a view of the back of the building showing how the developers saved parts of the original building that could be saved and the entrance behind the new outdoor patio space. The site received two cleanup grants totaling $177,351. That $177 came from DEED, came from Met Council, um, and they also received an earlier investigation grant. So why, while we encourage projects to apply for more than one type of Brownfield grant, sometimes other public grants are also part of the funding stack. Um, this project, again, also received early support from a $300,000 Hennepin County Transit-Oriented Development Grant awarded for improvements to utilities, sidewalks, and stormwater improvements in 2017. So not just stacking the deed cleanup grants or, or the um, all of the cleanup grants and investigation grants, but also leveraging some of those other funding sources is really helpful to get a fully, fully financed project. So our next example is uh, the Capstone 35 in Burnsville. 
So at the time the of application, which was in May 2021, the site was being used by a landscaping business to store, sort, and resell topsoil. So sometimes the contamination isn't obvious. Before it was a landscaping business, though, the site had been used as an unpermitted industrial waste dump since around 1984. Prior investigations showed a lot of buried fill with concrete and asphalt, and an additional investigation that was sent with a request to reveal petroleum impacts and debris in the soil below the piles of topsoil and methane in the soil vapor. The project had completed their response action plan by March 2021. The cleanup was expected to be done by September 2021, but the cleanup was actually finished when the soil vapor system was tested after the foundation was in and the shell was up in the fall of 2022. We couldn't grant the entire cleanup request, but we got close to about 99% with grants from DEED, Met Council, and Dakota County. The funding for the project changed after the grants were awarded, adding more county funding and more TIF. The project also received a DEED redevelopment grant. After redevelopment, the site has two large industrial buildings with two primary tenants. The first one is Irby, which is a supply chain partner for broadband, gas, and electric utilities. And the second is Acme Tools, which is a family-owned tool retailer with 10 locations in North Dakota, Minnesota, and Iowa. Um, that started out as a mail order catalog business, um, but they were able to add some stores and new online options. Thank you, Kristen. So I, you know, for the audience, I think what's important to remember is that there's a lot of ways that we can support a project early on in the investigation or later. And this is some good examples here of uh, stacking funding from from different sources. So let's take a look at uh, Metropolitan Council. The Metropolitan Council's cleanup grant program, also known as the Tax Based Revitalization Account or TBRA. Uh, can also work with the same development types that apply to DEED. So those developments like a multifamily apartment, uh, commercial or industrial or retail developments. And similar to DEED, uh, the Metropolitan Council is looking for projects that uh, have to overcome significant problems with contamination, uh, projects that will increase the local tax base and add jobs. In our case, we're especially looking at living wage jobs. And we also have an added focus, maybe less of a focus uh, than, than, than DEED, which is affordable housing. So that's kind of highlighted in orange here on your slide. For each application, the Metropolitan Council also looks at some other uh, community development goals. Those are things like reusing vacant sites, uh, encouraging the use of transit, using best practices for stormwater management, or using renewable energy. We consider the overall need for public funding and local capacity as part of what could be called readiness. And lastly, we consider the different ways that your development plan has been communicated to neighbors and others that could either be positively or negatively affected by the development. So we're really kind of trying to ask a lot of questions, both about the cleanup and uh, the development, as you've seen uh, in some of the prior examples. So the first example is Amber Union in Falcon Heights. Uh, this project was once, uh, this site rather, was once a Farmers Union Grain Terminal Association headquarters. Uh, it had a lab, it had a garage that was built about a decade later. Uh, their buildings are known for their Art Deco style, uh, but the buildings also had a lot of asbestos and lead-based paint that needed to be managed or removed before conversion of the buildings to affordable apartments. So if you passed by this site uh, long ago, you might have known this as the Ties building. There was a, a sign out front that said Technology and Information Educational Services. The environmental investigations were uh, conducted back in 2018 and 2019. Uh, they found there was uh, PCE and other non-petroleum volatile organic compounds in the soil vapor. The Concentrations were higher, uh, closest to that annex on the west side of the site that had been used as an event center. There are also PAHs found, but really only in one sample that had a, a concentration over the soil reference value. So sometimes you find contamination, but it's less of a concern than, than you, you might expect. Uh, this site also had uh, some very large gas uh, tanks and that were removed 
before the grant applications are received. So sometimes some cleanup is being done even before uh, it really becomes a, a candidate for our brownfield program. In this particular case, the cleanup required abatement of the interior and putting an active subslab depressurization system into that west building, that former garage building. Excavation and disposal of the contaminated soil and sealing of an existing on-site well. So originally expected uh, in June, about two years ago, the construction on the apartments was completed in December of 22, and the planned retail space uh, changed somewhat. It was replaced with additional residential and amenity space afterwards. So if that, you know, a minor change like that is something that uh, happens from time to time, but we really want to know about what you're planning to build on your site, what that's going to turn into. Let's look at another example. Uh, this second example is a project that is still under develop. This is Parkera in Plymouth. Uh, this property has been used as a retail nursery for over 50 years. The seller had agreed to remove some of the petroleum products and agricultural chemicals before the sale of the property, but other contaminants were found on site. Asbestos was found in the building materials. Uh, prior investigations also showed a lot of buried fill with concrete and asphalt on a privacy berm on the north side. And an additional investigation that was sent in with the grant request revealed elevated levels of arsenic in the soil, likely related to the use of agricultural chemicals. The soil vapor testing wasn't complete at the time of the application. We had had one seasonal round, but not both. Uh, later testing reports showed that PCE and TCE uh, were found in concentrations below mitigation action levels in the soil vapor. So ultimately, no soil vapor mitigation system was required by the Pollution Control Agency for this particular site. The site has been cleaned up, uh, but some of the construction has been delayed. So, uh, uh, and it's also possible that a privately funded uh, sub slab depressurization system could be added uh, to this site. So I mentioned that it's partially complete. The utilities have been installed. There is a Twin Cities Orthopedics uh, building that uh, had a ribbon cutting back in October of 2023. Uh, but the construction of the apartments with many of the natural and energy saving features uh, has been delayed. And we're expecting and hoping that that will happen here in the next year or two. So next, Michael is going to tell us about uh, Brownfield grants in Hennepin County. Uh, thanks, Marcus. Yeah, so uh, Hennepin County uh, ERF um, Environmental Response Fund prioritizes the need and extent of cleanup required. And how quickly you can uh, start the cleanup or project readiness as you heard it in other grant programs the two projects that Mar marcus talked about also occurred in Hennepin county but we'll kind of dive into a couple other examples uh, so uh you can see how the projects vary um although the any contaminate or potentially contaminated site may be considered for an era grant we uh, encourage the development of publicly owned um, property, uh, park space, schools, and mun municipal buildings, um, or projects where the community will result in social value from the proposed cleanup and rede redevelopment. Social values we see in the past grants are, you know, uh, things like job creation, uh, tax base enhancement. Uh, restoration or uh, replacement of deteriorated or uh, um, obsolete structures, uh, development of a community asset, and um, in involvement of project uh, stakeholders. The ERF is looking for projects that include, for example, uh, affordable housing, blight reduction or infill um, removal of properties that are possibly orphan sites that are too small to generate uh, significant tax base increases and are not attractive to large development and uh, sustainability, uh, particularly activities that are above and beyond typical building components like uh, LED lighting, high efficiency appliances, that kind of stuff, but offer um, sustainable features in the project design, construction and operation and in, and in a cleanup remedy. Uh, other factors to consider before applying for ERS are if if uh, local or other uh, funds will be committed to the project. Uh, the site had previously received an ERF grant 
and needs to implement, uh, you know, a wrap or response action plan or, or conduct additional assessment. And the project requires no funding for acquisition related costs. And, you know, it's just a metric that we use, but uh, we've, we've seen properties come into our program that required acquisition and some that don't, and we, we judge it accordingly. Uh, so let's look at a couple of examples. This example involved a part of Bassett Creek, as you can see in the upper right and uh, in the follow-up picture. In addition to redevelopments, uh, Henry County ERF also supports projects with environmental restoration focus. So let's look at an example of multi-year effort to repair the erosion of Bassett Creek. The intent of the project was to improve fish and aquatic habitat that had been clogged with sediment near properties with this with, with a history of, inc of contamination cleanup at various industrial sites along the, uh, about a three quarter mile part of the stream. At the time, it was estimated that 1900 cubic yards of contaminated soil would be needed to be removed and disposed of um, and before the installation of riprap, geofabrics and other methods to slow uh, stormwater, ultimately decreasing sediment downstream. The project, Started with a feasibility study in 2016, followed with the approval of a cleanup plan, the uh, RAP, by the MPCA. The initial plans were created by the Watershed Commission to share at various public engagements and open houses throughout the year. The required permitting and negotiating with uh, property owners started by the Bassett Creek Watershed Management Commission in 2018. Uh, the project was originally expected to cost about a million dollars but it ended up costing just under 800,000. An ERF grant of 150,000 was awarded in January 2018 and was extended in April 2020, but only uh, $36,000 was spent because of the change in the project scope, um, because of the inability to get access to one side of the streams and along a larger private property. The cleanup was, was done mostly in December of 2020 after uh, uh, USA CE permit was granted. Before we go to the next example, Mike, I want to say this is a, a good way to highlight that sometimes you be this environmental benefit. Uh, and if you have a project like that in mind, uh, keep Hennepin County in mind. All right, let's go to the next one. Yep, thanks, Marcus. Um, and so this uh, this next project uh, involves the Emerson Village Apartments in Minneapolis. The, the site was recently used as a nonprofit art studio, uh, juxtaposition arts, but historically it was used by uh, electro electronics manufacturing business. The site is an old uh, site is old enough to have see, been heated by using coal for 70 years. At the time, it was suspected that the site was impacted by a former dry cleaner nearby. The main contaminants of concern were asbestos and lead-based paint in the building itself and uh, lead and uh, uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons in the soil and volatile organic chem uh, compounds in the soil vapor. Uh, so we had a lot going on. Um, the project requested funding primarily from Hennepin County and detections for benzene were found to be below, uh, below the action level. So uh, taking out the cost for a soil vapor resulted in a revised request to Henry County for about 93,000. We know it often takes much more than Brownfield's funding to make a project feasible. This project was supported by a variety of other grant sources, including um, uh, Minnesota Housing, Henry County Supportive Services and Accelerated Funding, Minneapolis City Affordable Housing Trust Fund, and the Metrop Metropolitan Council Livable Communities demonstration account programs, kind of a mouthful <laughs> programs, um, but they all worked in uh, cooperation to get this uh, project um, moving along. This, so the site was developed into, uh, or had plans to develop into 40 uh, units of affordable housing with supportive services. And uh, real estate closing was expected back in August, 2023. There's been some, some delays, um, as projects do experience. And currently the asbestos abatement was completed and they've started on 
components of the soil uh, cleanup. So next, Ella will share information about the Ramsey County ERF program. Uh, before we get to Ella here, I just wanted to point out one thing about the funding, going back to the, kind of those circles there. So the Metropolitan Council did award a grant uh, for this site, but once there was a change in the total cleanup cost, um, one of the measures that we use is uh, if the ratio of the total cleanup costs is 1% of the total development costs. So in this case, that was very close, that ratio. And once that uh, cost went down, it actually became ineligible. So I wanted to point out that you can get a grant, but you know that need factor is something that can trip a project up from time to time. All right, let's uh, take a look at uh, Ramsey County. Great. Um, so with Ramsey County Environmental Response Fund, I think you'll you'll hear a lot of similarities. Um, we you know we have some priorities that are more significant in Ramsey County than in um, the other programs. So uh, you know in general, there's really a variety of community development considerations, but affordable housing, especially units you know, affordable to housing at 30% of area median income or lower, um, that's kind of our highest priority. Uh, we also prioritize sites um, that are in environmental justice areas of concern as defined by MPCA. And of course, the significant the significant uh, of the cleanup amount. Some of the other um, things, you know, doesn't just I, even though I think affordable housing is kind of our top line priority. Don't just be if your project isn't affordable housing doesn't mean you shouldn't apply. We also look at increase in jobs, increase in tax base, um, that readiness factor. Uh, how soon are you ready to, to go on the project? And then geographic balance. So we are in Ramsey County uh, required to spread the funding around and and uh, to different suburbs, especially, you know, we get a lot of applications in the city of St. Paul, but especially if you have a suburban project, uh, that often can be a little bit of an advantage actually. Um, so now we can look at a couple of examples. So first we have uh, Soul Apartments. I think this is this is a great example because I think that this is like almost like the quintessential, you know, stacking of funding sources. So this is in the city of St. Paul um, and it really hit a lot of uh, Ramsey County's priorities. As you can see, there's that tax base increase on the top, uh, 19 jobs. That's a mix of new and retained jobs, over 9,000 square feet of retail space, and then uh, 174 housing units, 139 of which were affordable or are affordable. So for this project, environmental investigation confirms soil contamination, and they uh, requested and received funding for both soil remediation and soil vapor mitigation from DEED, Met Council, and uh, the Ramsey County Environmental Response Fund, as you can see here. They also, you know, had some interesting things where because there was flooding at the site, you know, it's it's very close to the river. They had to build a bigger stormwater system and manage more contaminated soil as they were going through construction. So they did receive a supplemental grant of almost $400,000 from the Met Council in January of 2024. So I think typically many of these programs, um, or at least Ramsey County Environmental Response Fund uh, can only pay for costs incurred after date of award, but there are you know, some of the other funders have a little bit more flexibility there. And next we have Lauderdale Senior Housing. So again, we usually encourage cleanup projects to request funding from multiple sources, but it is possible to um, for Ramsey County Environment, Environmental Response Fund or any of the other funders to be the sole uh, public funding source. So this site was originally the old Lauderdale Elementary School and then was later used as a church, uh, but it was owned by the city when they applied for earth funding. The building had been vacant for several years at that time, and a local developer started working with the city on the site in 2019. This one is interesting. You know, the site did have some historical fill soil and debris, um, and tests had found soil contamination and soil vapor, but they were all uh, below soil reference values and kind of the other measures for contamination. And there was also some petroleum contamination that was funded from another source. So you can see here that the um, Ramsey County Environmental Response Fund funding was used for 
asbestos abatement um, prior to demolition. So um, that's another kind of unique thing that some of us can pay for asbestos abatement and others do not. I think this, you know, as you can see from the metrics at the top, again, this was a lot of, um, hits a lot of the Ramsey County priorities. It does have a tax base increase, a small amount of jobs, and then really those affordable units are very important. It also has a lot of other public funding. So it has low income housing tax credits, uh, tax increment financing, tax exempt bonds, and also um, federal American Rescue Plan Act funding. So uh, the project opened in September of 2023. It is a senior building uh, with that is all affordable. Uh, most of those are for 60% AMI uh, residents with uh, 11 affordable at less than 30% AMI. So yeah, again, I think this one's unique because it's you know just asbestos, just one funder and in a smaller suburban city, but it kind of shows the range of things that are funded. Well, I'm going to talk a little bit about timing and um, how Brownfields grants fit into a typical redevelopment process. So before you'll be able to get a grant, you'll need to have site control, which we talked about earlier. You just need access to the site. You don't necessarily have to be the owner of the site, but you have to be able to get onto the site to do the investigation activities. So I would say the best time to apply for an investigation grant is kind of when the development team is doing its due diligence or working to get development or entitlement approvals. Sometimes the phase one is done, sometimes it's not quite done yet. Just if there's an interest in a property, you want more information and you have a plan in place of how you might develop the site once the investigation is completed. So I would say the best time to request a cleanup grant is after the development plan's been approved by the city, and the development team's working on getting commitments for the sources for the construction financing. So as we said before, you can't apply for a cleanup grant until you have that response action plan or wrap approved by the MPCA. So for cleanup grants, we collectively expect that the construction's gonna start, the cleanup's gonna start, and the construction's gonna start um, soon after getting a grant. Like we said, we have grant rounds every six months, so if you're not ready, um, you can wait till the next one. So um, usually, you know, within the first six months to a year, that cleanup and construction is going to begin. We are also expecting the construction to be completed or substantially completed and new tenants or users are on the site within that three-year grant term. So as I said, we offer funding twice a year, um, once in the spring and once in the fall. So our next application deadline is May 1st. It's May 1st and November 1st every year. And as Marcus had said earlier, our programs were created to you know, work together in tandem, but there's some differences about them. But one of the things that's common is our application deadlines. So we usually have a sense of how much funding is available a couple months before the deadline. It doesn't often change drastically, but it can take a couple of months to prepare an application once you start working with consultants, developers, the city, or the development authority staff. Grants are typically awarded around two months after the deadline. So for a May 1st deadline, usually the end of June or beginning of July is when the awards will be announced. Um, then after that, it could take another month or two to get grant agreements fully executed and all the signatures. And in many cases, work can't begin until that contract is signed. Um, for deed, work can begin sooner if certain criteria have been met. So again, if you're not sure or you don't think you're ready to apply in this upcoming May grant round, Again, we offer the funding twice a year, every year. It's always there. So the next application deadline will be November 1st. So if you look at the chart on the screen, you can kind of tell when you should start thinking about the next grant round. As Marcus said, it's typically a few months before the application deadline. Um, sometimes it's best to check with if you're not a city or a public entity, to check with that public entity, they might have some deadlines of their own. So you might need to back up your timeline a little bit to accommodate some of the city's 
council's deadlines. So if you found your project site and the timing seems right to apply for a grant, the next step is confirming that you have everything you need for your project to be eligible. So before applying for a grant, you want to think about whether you have that those completed documents that list and qualify the contamination, such as a wrap, a wrap approval, or in some cases, a hazardous materials survey. You want to make sure that the development team isn't responsible for the contamination. We can talk more about responsible parties in a little bit, but that kind of mucks things up a little bit. And also, if the applicant is going to support your request, again, you'll want to talk to the cities, particularly projects in St. Paul or Minneapolis have to go through a city-led pre-application process, so it could take a little bit of time, but you'll, you'll want to get your public entity slash applicant on board with your project as early in the process as you can. So after you've confirmed that your site is eligible, the next thing to consider is how to allocate the costs in your budget. So if you have abatement costs, just confirm that those costs are eligible from the county or Met Council or both. Like deed doesn't pay for asbestos. So if you had just asbestos abatement, then deed wouldn't be the place for you to apply. We do have uh, money, as I said earlier, in a different grant, a redevelopment grant, but just kind of know as we've talked about all the di differences in the programs, kind of choose what's the best place to ask for funds. So there are some things that we want to point out that uh, that could trip you up. So before applying for a grant, consider whether there is someone uh, or some organization responsible for the contamination on the site. Uh, as Kristen mentioned, that's what we call a responsible party in legal terms. So if you think there might be one, an RP, uh, call us or schedule a meeting before starting the application. Uh, there are situations where we can uh, support a, a request like that, but but really we have to get into quite a bit of detail before we can decide that and we want to save you some time. Also consider when you expect to start the environmental work and the construction. So Kristen mentioned before that maybe in some specific conditions you can start early, but in general, if you want to start the work before a grant is awarded, it, it may not be eligible. Uh, so for example, the Met Council won't accept a new grant request for, for cleanup costs that have been already incurred before you're applying for it, before you get that grant signed. Other uh, programs do have those uh, specific requirements. So if your schedule, if you think, oh, my schedule conflicts with the grant schedule. Again, call us, set up a meeting. We can talk uh, before you put a lot of effort into starting and working on the application. Uh, lastly, for projects considering applying for the Met Council, I uh, want you to confirm that future property tax status, whether it's taxable or tax exempt. And as I mentioned in that example before, the share of total cleanup costs to the total development costs. So future developments must be taxable and the cleanup cost must be over 1% of the total development cost to qualify for a TBRA grant. It takes uh, uh, some collaboration to, to work on a cleanup uh, request. So above are the typical tasks that are responsibility of the development team when applying for a grant. And below on this uh, figure are the key steps in applying for the uh, applicant. So the applicant uh, in, in the case of deed and McCouncil is a public entity but it can be a private party if you're applying to one of the county programs and uh, the MPCA, as we, we heard earlier. It can, uh, as we said, it can take a few months to get all those things ready for the cleanup grant. It's a lot shorter for an investigation grant, but what uh, you really want to do is start with hiring that environmental consultant to do the phase one. If you're applying for a cleanup grant, we want you to hire that consultant to draft a cleanup plan using those uh, materials, those phase ones, those phase two environmental site assessments. Uh, next would be enrolling in the voluntary cleanup program, such as the voluntary investigation and cleanup program or petroleum brownfields program at the MPCA. And you'll want to contact a public applicant such as the city or the development authority about sponsoring your grant application. Again, that's primarily if you're applying for deed and council. Third, you will want to complete the application form, get a variety of those attachments. Uh, again, this is a team effort. It's usually led by the applicant, but it could be also done by someone hired by the developer. So starting earlier is better. 
Next, you'll submit your application in May, and sometimes we have some follow-up questions or there's something that we just didn't quite understand. So it's good to kind of save some time uh, for us to uh, talk with you or, or add anything that's missing. So if your uh, request is successful, you'll work with the grantor to sign a grant agreement. And if you get a grant from DEED or the Metropolitan Council, the development team will sign a separate subgrant agreement with the public grant recipient. So usually that's the city or development authority. So next we have a slide that just kind of outlines all of those forms and documents. In the interest of time today, I'm not going to go over those one by one, but there are also some links here to the uh, individual sites uh, with the forms. Some of them are online, some of them are not. All right, so to recap, and I'll just go over this quickly. I know we're running a little short on time. We offer about $8 million in grants and loans for each grant round in, in the spring and the fall, and some are on a rolling basis, as we talked about, so that's kind of outlined here. So shown here is the total amount of funding offered in either the calendar or fiscal year for investigations, and most programs have limits per project. Some programs split the total offered into two cycles. And then here's a similar chart for the cleanup grants. Again, some programs have limits per applicant. Most of the grants are competitive and the environmental investigation or cleanup is only one part of the competitive equations. Our grants are closely tied to construction either new or renovated buildings. And we went through all of our priorities earlier, but yeah, cleanup is just one component of how we score our projects. So if you're looking for help or wondering if the grant programs are worth it, we have many resources um, for you to contact. So first, as Marcus said, if you have questions, give us a call. If you're not sure your project's gonna qualify, for a grant, call us, or if you want to know what factors are most important, or you want to just talk about your site and um, you know how it might fit into our scoring criteria, just call us. If you'd rather hear from your peers, um, we can also provide examples of sites in addition to the ones that we provided today, or um, you can talk to other public staff or professional organizations or other people who have been involved with Brownfields grants in the past. So another resource available, if you're not sure how to get started or you're looking for help in identifying funding sources or wanna talk with staff that have worked with most, if not all these programs before, um, there's also another option of contacting the Technical Assistance to Brownfields program that's run by the Kansas State University. So the program provides free workshops, kind of like this one, and they also offer strategic planning, technical assistance to communities, and have a network of expertise and partners that can help you navigate through all different types of brownfields. To get started, you can contact Grisby. She's the Region 5 Manager for KSU TAB. We also have a local TAB representative, Kristen Prososky, and she's with uh, SEH Consulting right now. So we're just gonna recap quickly. Here's kind of the grant summary that we fund all sorts of redevelopments, industrial, residential, commercial, mixed use, even some public facilities. Some key dates to remember are shown on this slide. If your site requires a soil or soil vapor cleanup, hopefully you've submitted your wrap to the MPCA already because their deadline is next week, which is March 1st. Um, if your project is in Minneapolis or St. Paul, again, those cities have their own pre-application requirements, so you should contact those city staff right away if you're um, considering a May 1st application. For programs with the May 1st deadline, you need to submit your completed ap application to us by that date. Awards are typically announced at the end of June again um, through August, depending on which program you apply to. Grant agreements are usually signed and ready for you to start work by summer early fall. If this timing doesn't work for you, remember we offer every six months. I can't stress that enough. So we want to distribute our funding throughout the state. So in terms of location, Hennepin County does not have specific targets, but consideration will be given to equitable distribution of the ERF between urban, suburban, and rural. Um, same with Rams or Ramsey County, and you heard Ella talk about that earlier. So to close, if there's any questions that you have for us, I see we're 
pretty much out of time, but we're willing to stay on a little longer if, if, if folks have some more questions. I don't see anything in the chat. All right, well, we'll, we'll just maybe if you're thinking of one, we'll give two hmm. questions that uh, I think are pretty common. This, how about this one? All right, so the question is, should I stack grant funding? I would say for investigations, no. There's a rare, rare case if you have a very complicated site and a very expensive investigation and the $50,000 that most of investigations are capped at won't cover the costs or a large percentage of the costs, you might be able to stack, but that would be a rare case. But if you're looking for cleanup, yes, yes, we encourage you to stack as many grant sources as possible. All right, we'll do one more. Which funding sources should I choose, Kristen? There's so many options. Oh boy. I think this question is best answered during a conversation or a meeting. I mean, we always say pick the grant sources with similar redevelopment goals to your projects. It's hard for us to answer that. We do get that a lot. Like how much should I ask from each grantor and who should I apply to? It's really hard. It's really hard um, without knowing the nuances of each individual project to even venture a guess for that. So here is our contact information. Uh, so we do, we would love to hear about your projects as they're coming through. Uh, we have uh, here all of our numbers from the grant programs you've heard of today. Uh, we have an, another set here from uh, some of the uh, programs that uh, are offering funding that even weren't present with us today. But all of them are, are really uh, willing to help you and, and interested in, in helping figure out this process of which, which grant is right for you and how to make sure you're eligible and, and, and ready to apply. So we really appreciate you sticking with us today. This is the end of our presentation. Uh, we hope you found it useful. Uh, we will send out the slides to folks that registered today. And thank you for joining us. I see we have one raised hand. I don't know if that Do we? OK, I'm glad, you, I'm glad you saw it. I'm glad you saw it. Anyways, my question to you would be, so this the environmental side of the grant or the investigation thing, do you need something to happen first before you even apply for that? So should you get that environmental person um, to do the initial to say that, yes, there's probably contamination here or how do you break into that portion of it? Well, I think in terms of we were looking at funding sites for uh, that have some likelihood or you know perceived contamination. So there's usually a little bit of background that we want to know about your site to know if if well, we think really more testing is is warranted. Um, sometimes that can come from just knowing a little bit about the history of how the site was used. Other times you can uh, maybe have a request from one of these grantors today to have just that phase one environmental site assessment done, and that will give you a more comprehensive history. Okay. Uh, so you see a recommendation here in the chat too about using like Sanborn maps. Okay, and then can you use that money? Like if you did that phase one, could you use that as part of your matching funds? Dollars? Uh, correct. Yeah. Yes. And okay. Yeah, go ahead. I'll just go since Deed has the Deed's get the one with the match. Um, yes, you can use those those um, costs already incurred as part of your match. If you came in for an investigation grant and you did a phase one already, and you're requesting funds to do that phase two work and um, wrap work, you can use that phase one as your match. Similarly, with cleanup, if you come in for a Deed cleanup match grant, which also has a 25% match, you can use your investigation costs already incurred in many cases as part of your 25% match. And it looks like uh, Martha and, and Paula indicated about the uh, Sanburn insurance maps and Martha uh, included the link to what's in my neighborhood, but uh, that's been a, a really resourceful tool uh, to just kind of give you an idea of what's out there and uh, you know, if there's any information that you could kind of glean off of off of your site or, or uh, um, your potential site. Yeah, all great places to get started. 
All right, we got one more question here. Uh, do the construction projects have to be a full building or can it be used to upgrade pre-existing landscaping issues? So I'll say for the point of the Met Council, really we focus on that redevelopment aspect. So if the use is really going to be the same use it is as it is today, uh, that's probably not a competitive uh, grant category, uh, project rather, for our types of grants. Um, but if there is some kind of significant renovation, you can use the same building shell, let's say, or if you're changing that use in that building um, and you have to take some extra steps to make that safe, that would be a, a, a candidate for a grant. Right. Um, I'm not sure if maybe Hennepin County is different. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, it could be. It, it, I guess it depends on the project itself, but, um, you know, I think you're referring, referring to um you know existing grade or trying to you know uh deal with some uh underlying contamination and if you're expanding on your your building footprint that might be eligible depending on um the you know if, if your soil is impacted above criteria so it, it would have a you'd have to you know give more specifics and for us to kind of talk on it but it, it would be eligible given the right circumstances in Upper Hennepin County. Yeah, for deed, I would mimic what Marcus said. I mean, one thing that also needs to happen for um, a deed grant is usually these projects have some sort of property transaction. So if you are a manufacturer and you've been operating in your site for years and all of a sudden you found out you may have a vapor issue for instance our grant is really for new developer new developments and not to retrofit an existing business um with you know soil or uh, cleanup issues all right well thank you everyone for attending and the presentation should be available shortly yes yes all right well thanks again and we wish you a great afternoon.